Hey brothers and sisters, today on this church morning, we're going to be reading again in the Great Leaders of the Christian Church. I hope you can tell that I really love this book, and I hope you do too. It's an awesome book. I love hearing about these people. Today, we're going to hear of a man, a very famous man. Well, maybe not very famous, but he's pretty, pretty famous across evangelical Christianity. He lived from... Can you guess it? 296 through 373. He wrote a book called The Life of St. Anthony. Can you guess yet? Well, his name is Athanasius. Athanasius. And, yep, he lived from 296 through 373. So, let's go ahead and take a look at the pictures before we start. That's a... Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria. And then shows um, um, the head title for this is Athanasius wrote a life story, a life of Anthony, one of the first hermits to settle in the Egyptian desert. And then um, let's see what else is there. Oh, there's a one on each page. Okay, this one says, Roman Porta Nigra, Tier. Athanasius was exiled to Trier in 335 through 336. That's what that looks like. And the last one, this is going to be a longer video. It says, Roman Bass, Trier, site of Athanasius' exile. So, sorry, I couldn't do it very well, but... Let's go ahead and start reading right now, because it's not too long before I have to go to church, but here we go. In his own lifetime, Athanasius became a legend. His, his name was synonymous with, the, with Nicene Orthodoxy, the faith that was to triumph eight years after his death at the First Council of Constantinople, 381. Later generations came to regard him as an archetypal representative of the Alexandrian school of theology, even though he himself had done little to develop a distinctive theological outlook. Athanasius's anti-Arian discourses and related works from the bulk of his literary output. Oh, no. Athanasius's anti-Arian discourses and related works form the bulk of his literary output. His treatise on the Incarnation, through faulty in places, though faulty in places, has remained a classic work on the subject to this day. Moreover, his Life of St. Anthony is now universally regarded as a classic of the solitary life. In, in a word, Athanasius left an enduring imprint on the life and thought of the Christian churches. Athanasius, a pillar of orthodoxy, orthodoxy Gerald L. Bray. Bishop of Alexandria. Anth Athanasius was born at Alexandria about AD 296. As a young man, he was strongly attracted to the hermits of Egypt, the Egyptian desert. In, in later life, he did much to popularize their beliefs and way of life. In return, the hermits, or monks as they came to be called, provided him with a solid base of support in the controversies that dominated his career. Though he was a child of Christian parents, he received a normal classic, classical education of a gentleman. He was ordained deacon in 319 and became bishop, the bishop's secretary. Accompanying him to the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. In the year 328, Athanasius was himself elected bishop of Alexandria, an office he occupied until his death 46 later, years later. Most of his episcopate was taken up with the struggle to defend the decisions of the Council of Nicaea against Arius, and especially against those who wanted to work out some kind of compromise with Arius. Athanasius was ordered by the emperor to admit Arians to communion, but he refused and in 335 was deposed from the office. Soon afterwards, he was exiled to Trier, but when the emperor Constantine died, 337, Athanasius was able to return to his see. Adversary of Arianism. He was not there long, though, because his many enemies in the church managed to have him deposed and exiled again. From 339 to 346, he spent most of his 
time in Rome. His periods of exile in the West had become a great had great political importance because he was able to use them to rally Rome and the Latin churches to his cause. In Egypt, his sufferings made him a popular hero that ensured that Arianism would never gain never gain a firm foothold in Alexandria. Athanasius was eventually allowed to return to his diocese, but in 355 he was exiled again, this time at the instigation of the of the Emperor Constantius II, who, like his father, was trying to accommodate the Arians and their sympathizers. On this occasion, Athanasius went to the monks of the desert, where he had spent much of his youth, and devoted himself to writing. In the year 362, he returned to Alexandria, only to be exiled again almost immediately. But the following year, Athanasius went back permanently and remained until his death in 373. Athanasius the Writer Athanasius wrote a large number of works, though most of his writings were done during the various periods of exile he endured. He was particularly productive during the last of them, when the solitude of the desert and the tense spiritual and political conditions combined to provide him with an unusual degree of inspiration. His style is lucid and attractive, unlike with the more literary comp composition of his contemporaries, though he lacks their scholarly depth and range. And range. Most of what he had to say was connected in one way or another to the battle against Arianism, in which his skills as a debater were employed to the full. Apart from a few fragments, only one of his commentaries on the Bible has survived. That is a lengthy exposition of the Psalms, which he relates to the spiritual needs of a believer. Oddly enough, there is no evidence that Athanasius ever wrote on a, a commentary on any part of the New Testament, although his her hermeneutical ability is brought out clearly in his writings against Arius. Against Arius. The anti-Arian discourses and related works are noted for the way in which Athanasius took favorite proof texts of the Arians, especially Hebrews 3.2 and Proverbs 8.22, and demonstrated that they do not mean what the Arians claimed. Athanasius' refutations are more remarkable in that he was not adverse to using al allegorical methods in, of exegesis. In particular, he was prone to regard the entire Bible as fundamentally Christological. That put him at a disadvantage in dealing with many Old Testament texts, where a modern exegete would not find any direct reference to Christ at all. But that difficulty did not worry, un worry an atheist. Athanasius and Dolly. He treated such texts as spe a special challenge and often used great ingenuity to demonstrate that Arian, urban, Arian interpretations, which were also Christological, were basically mistaken. Another important work is The Double Treases Against the Heathen and On the Incarnation. The second part of that work is often printed separately and is well known as a classical statement of Alexandrian Christology. It is remarkable that it is largely free of anti-Aryan statements, a fact that has encouraged many scholars to assign an early date to it. The first section is less well known, but it contains an important refutation of paganism in the traditional style. In particular, Athanasius argued that idolatry and pantheism must be wrong because God and man are distinct essences. However, he accepted the common Greek view that the human soul can have a true knowledge of God and creation, because the soul is a mirror image of the Logos, or the Word of God. Athanasius and Anthony In addition to those major works, there are a number of sermons and letters extant, as well as the remnants of what seem to have been left several treatises on virginity. That interest testifies Athanasius' well-known ascetic learnings, which are clearly stated in his famous Life of Saint Antony. Antony, Antony, sorry, 251 through 356, was a hermit who lived to the remarkable age of 105. He was among the first to seek solitude in the desert, in the Egyptian desert, where he warred against the spiritual forces of temptation in a way that recalls the wilderness experiences of many biblical figures, including Jesus himself. 
Athanasius believed that such a form of spirituality was most to be desired for a truly serious Christian, and he wrote, in order to encourage monasticism among the members of the wider church, in that effort he was outstandingly successful. Because of Athanasius' importance as a symbol of orthodoxy, there were a lot of number of spurious works to which his name is attached. Attached. Most of these subsist today only in fragments, but one is exceptionally famous. This so-called Athanasian Creed, or Quincunque Volt, a statement of post-Chalcedonian orthodoxy that later generations erroneously attributed to the great bishop of Alexandria. It is a Latin text of um, 500 AD, which defines the church's faith for many generations. As a theological statement, it is particularly notable for its endorsement of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son, Filioque, which makes it the earliest creedal document to do so. For that reason, it was always regarded as spurious in the Eastern Church, and today is no longer widely used, even in the West. The main reason for that is its uncompromising insistence that those who do not hold to the Orthodox faith are doomed to everlasting damnation a sentiment that does not appeal to the liberal spirit of our age, though it undoubtedly represents the belief of Athanasius and, the va and of the mass, vast majority of Christians in ancient time. Athanasius's Theology Athanasius was not an original theologian, though his writings have come to be regarded as, an as the essential statement of the Alexandrian position on the key Christolog Christological controversies of the time. That can be best understood by saying that both Athanasius and his Arian opponents were indebted to Origen, AD 185 through 254, the greatest, mo greatest and most original theologian of the ancient Greek church. Both sides in the controversy employed the same allegorical techniques in their exegesis of sc scripture, and both regarded Origen as the privileged exponent of that method. Where they differed, was that Arius emphasized certain aspects of Origen's teaching that appeared to Athanasius and the other leading to Alexandrians to contradict the scripture and distort the true meaning of Origen's interpretations. Arius emphasized the or Originist theme of the unique divinity of the Father, to whom the Son was eternally subordinate. However, the Son's eternal ex existence was purely relative and looked towards the temporal future only. In the past, claimed Arius, there was a time when the sun had not existed. That went against Origen teaching that the sun was eternally begotten of the Father, even though Origen had been ready to concede that the sun was in some respects the inferior of the two persons. Origen had been able to hold the rather curious doctrine because he was fundamentally a Platonist who believed the differences in the name between the Father and the Son implied a necessary difference of substance as well. That meant that the Father could be God, not the, but not the Son, since the Son had a different name. And that Arius, in fact, believed that the Son was a creature, the firstborn, quote, firstborn of all creation, as being... He was higher than the angels, but lower than God himself. Furthermore, Arius insisted that the inferiority of, to God was necessary if the Son were to become a man and take on human sorrows of suffering and death. All the ancients, ancients believed that God was impassable. From that, Arius concluded that the suffering Savior could not be God. He also believed that only a creature could properly be identified with us, because, pre because between the being of God and the existence of man, there is no common measure or point of contact. Athanasius attacked Arianism by saying that Arius had misunderstood Origen, which was true, and that the latter had always insisted that the Son was just as eternal as the Father. To Athanasius, eternity... Eternity meant equality, and he therefore repudiated the subordinistic um, streak in the Origenist tradition. That was strictly in line with the decree of the Council of Nicaea, which had declared that the Son was consubstantial, humosios, it's a Greek word, um, with the Father. The precise meaning of that term became a matter of heated debate when semi-Aryan sympathizers, like the 
church historian Eusebius of Caesarea tried to maintain that not what Nicaea had meant was that the sun was a similar substance, humoiosuisios, <laughs> is a Greek word, to the Father, but he was not the same because he was numerally, numerically distinct and God was one. The Trinity. To that challenge, Athanasius replied that the persons of the Trinity all shared the oneness of God and that they could not be regarded as distinct in substance. The, dis the difference between them were expressed in their names, which were not interchangeable. Athanasius lacked the developed doctrine of the person that would give his weight to the idea later on, but his instinct for script the scriptural concept of the name was sound, and it was incorrupted into later in systematic reflection. In the development of his Christology, Athanasius repudiated the philosophical foundations that had underpinned so much of what both Origen and Arius had said, and moved and said to the biblical concept of redemption as the foundation for a true Christology. Redemption, argued Athanasius, could only from from God, and since only God was righteous enough to satisfy the demands of his own justice. For that reason, our salvation could only be guaranteed if God himself became man and did the impossible by suffering and dying for us, so that we, too, might do the impossible, become like God. To that end, Athanasius developed a Christology that to a great extent is the extended commentary on John 1, 14, quote, The Word became flesh. His word flesh, or in the Greek, logosarx, Christology is what is so typical of Alexandrian theology. It is a great it is, its great strength is what it makes is that it makes the logos word the subject of the incarnation. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, not a glorified or glorified creature, and therefore he can exercise all the prerogatives of divinity as of right. Its weaknesses is, its weakness is that it has an understanding of the flesh that is inadequate. Soul and flesh. For Athanasius, as for the most philosophical trained Greeks of his time, the flesh was no more than the physical part of man. It did not, it did not include the soul, which man, which was created in the image of the divine logos. That, however, raised a serious problem. Did Jesus have a human soul in addition to the logos, or is the logos equivalent of a soul in him? The argument is not trivial. Because the soul is the seat of sin, and if the sinless Logos has taken its place, then Jesus could not have sinned, which made all the temptations meaningless, nor could he have been, become sin for us. Athanasius did not actually say whether he believed that Jesus had a human soul or not, but it seems likely that he did allow for it. Because it was attached to the Logos, it had no independent life of its own. That compromise was unsatisfactory. However, it and led to a Christ crisis in Alexandrian Christology shortly after his death. Apollinarius, a pupil of Athanasius, took his master's teaching to its logical conclusion and denied the existence of a human soul in Jesus. He was condemned at a number of synods between 377 and 880, 388, but Alexandrian Christology was thenceforth branded as docetic because it was supposed to be the denying of the full humanity of Christ. And other matters, Athanasius was very much a child of his time. He advocated the rebaptism of those who had been baptized by heretics on the ground that they were been baptized with the wrong intention and the wrong spirit. He also held a high view of the Holy Communion and believed that the Holy Spirit descended into the elements at the moment of invocation. Applicasis. That teaching was rejected by the Western Church and is especially by the Reformers, but it has been revived in modern times and forms a prominent feature, feature of modern liturgical reforms that seek to recover the spirit of the early church. So that's it. Okay. You might be wondering that... Ooh, it's just kind of weird. Some of the stuff, he's very strong about orthodoxy, but some of the stuff... Don't worry, Athanasius, was, he was a man of God, but... Not all of the things he said were true, but the thing, the thing we know of God is because Athanasius, don't let me be confused, he did support the full humanity of Christ and the full divinity of Christ and that he was equal with the Father and that he was God. And it says here too, it's just 
it's just it might be kind of confusing because it jumps back and forth and back and forth between Arius Athanasius, Apollinaris, yes, and Athanasius, but it goes back and forth between the heretics and the in the person. But Jesus is God, and it's obvious. And we got to remember this man who fought so valiantly against Arianism, which is a false doctrine, which today is the basis of many cults, such as Jehovah's Witness and Mormonism. We need to read these works and get a biblical basis for this, because it's a deception that Jesus is not the Lord, not God. The Jehovah's Witness believe he was a god. He was a mighty angel, Michael the Archangel, the, just below God, but above the angels. Sound familiar? That's what Athanasius fought against. That's what Arius taught. And then there's the Mormons who believe that God, the Father, Elohim, had had sex with his spirit wife and had Satan and Jesus. So he's just the son of God, literally. And one last thing I just want to clear up, just so that you won't stumble in this fact, that Origen did a very good job of defending the divinity of Christ, because by saying that, like, um, using, because, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, Arius would use that, say he was begotten, he was created at a time. But Origen did the best he could, saying he was eternally begotten. Probably hard to explain, probably don't want to do that right now, because we're almost running out of time. Well, I don't have a time set, actually, but we're just taking a lot of time. But I want to say this. That was a Jewish and Greek idiom of the time of Jesus. This is what we know, because now we have a better understanding of the Greek of that time, Koine Greek. Um, it meant, the, the idiot, it literally me, translated is only begotten. But the idiom, like the metaphor, is one and only. So it can't be translated one and only, but that's what it means. Just like we say, uh, um, what's an idiom we have in English today? Um, what's up? Are we asking what's up in the sky? What's up? No, we're saying what's going on? What's, how's, go, how's it going? So it's a similar thing with this. So I hope... Yeah, so I'm not, I don't have any works on Athanasius, except I do have St. Anthony, so tell me if you want me to start reading it, anytime, I'll start doing it. Um, I have space for one more book. I have kind of neglected doing the Odes of Solomon lately, though, but God bless you, in Jesus' name. Have a good church service. Amen.